Very good. Now we want to go step by step. We don't want to leave any child behind, as we said. So we want to go. That's number five here. Very good. Okay, first of all, we want to repeat shortly what we did the last time. I showed you a page of Benjamin, right, and we explained it a little bit. He was one of the great critical theorists of the Frankfurt School. That's what we are about here. And we talked about his life and his great accomplishments and so on. Then we also talked about Habermas. That is the second generation. He's still alive. He is at Northern, not Western. University is here, so he has tremendously written, and you can see that in your syllabus. Does everybody have a syllabus in the meantime? Mm-hmm. Syllabus. Yeah. yeah. Can you get the syllabus from my website and okay. print it out? Okay. Right? So and in the website there is a depth study, and under depth study you can see Habermas and Benjamin and all these uh, uh, critical theorists. Okay. And then we discussed shortly uh, Judaism and uh, the religion of sublimity. When you look at our roadmap, on the roadmap B, you have, uh, you know what the roadmap is? Yes. Okay, very good. Under B, you see the different world religions. Here, this is what it looks like. That is the roadmap. And under B, you see then the... Uh, do I have another one? Probably not. Um, you see uh, different world religions, and there is one which is called Judaism, the religion of sublimity. And then you see also Islam, the religion of law, and so it is under B. And um, under Judaism, you see also that Judaism has gone through uh, four, five different paradigms. So you have in every religion, you have something constant, something which cannot be changed, and then you have the changes through which the religion went. So Judaism has six of them, tribal paradigm, then the empire paradigm, and then the theocratic paradigm, the rabbinical paradigm, and so on. You have the same thing with Islam too. Right? So in Islam, there are certain things which are unchangeable, constant, but then you have changes which have taken place through the centuries. And there, the Islam is the religion of uh, law, and uh, so you have the prim- primordial community in Mecca and Medina, you have the Arabic Empire paradigm, you have the world religion paradigm, and then you have the Ulama Sufi paradigm, and the end of philosophy, and then you have the modernization in Turkey, for instance, other places, and then you have a postmodern paradigm which is to be established now. So this is what we said the last time, and something came up, some of us wanted to know why that is called sublimity. So it's the Abrahamic community, faith community, and Abraham had this vision of a God who was not visible, he was invisible, and no images could be made of him, no real names. Uh, Yahweh means I am who I am, who I shall be, who I shall be, which is not a real name. And so he was not identical with anything in nature or anything in history. So it was very different from the gods of Mesopotamia, the gods of Egypt, and so on, who are all visible and had eyes and had legs and so on. Now the God of Abraham is invisible. He transcends nature and history. He is totally other, and at the same time, he is at work in human beings and in their lives, and the lives of their tribes and their families and, and so on. So that is new, that is sublime. But sublime means it is transcendent. It is not a god who is a god of the water or a, god, a sun god or the moon god or whatever. These are all parts of nature. The god of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and the god of Jesus and the god of Mohammed uh, is transcendent, but at the same time, imminent as well. So that's what we said about Judaism as religion. And then we also uh, talked about the Enlightenment, and this is something which is important here, and I think we came to the point where we said, the modernity, what makes so much trouble today, and we will have a time diagnosis again, um, we have to get a clear picture in the critical theory 
between those two, the religious side, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, these are all what you have here on the, on the road map. And on the other side, something completely new has come about. And that is what has happened in the West. It, did, it started in Greece and didn't go through. It started a little bit in China. It didn't go through. But in the West, it went through. What happened? It happened in the Christian uh, the Christian community, and from there it spread all over. The Christian community split in people, traditional people, who were pious and who read the Bible and who went to church and so on. Suddenly among them, some of them began to learn. That means they took what they had learned in religion, it was called scholasticism, with the categories which came from Aristotle, and you have it in Islam too, Averroes, for instance, many others were Aristotelians. So they used suddenly these categories, not in order to go up to the sublime, to the infinite, but they turned it all around, down toward the earth, toward nature. So a tremendous change. People transcended. When you go to Europe, you see those unbelievable cathedrals which are going straight up into the sky. And that was turned around. Modernity means that all this intelligence now is turned against nature. And they began to study nature, to telescopes. And then they used mathematics and applied it to it. And they discovered with Copernicus and Galileo and so on that this, what is here, is not static as it appears. And the sun does not rise as it appears. But this is turning around the sun and so on. So they turned the Copernican turn around. Very different from what is in the, uh, in the Holy Quran, what is in the Bible, in the Torah, or in Buddhism, or in Hinduism. They all thought that the sun was rising. And now it doesn't anymore. And there it started something. And when you get this enlightenment, you cannot stop it anymore. So the religious community was shocked by it. And they uh, wanted to stop it. They showed Galileo the waterboarding, the, uh, the torture thing. And uh, uh, so uh, he rescinded. He even said, you know, it's not true. The sun rises. But he whispered in his beard, no, it's not so. And then his daughter took his mathematical formulas, and it was published in Holland, and so it broke through. That means the religious community wanted to stop the whole thing and practically tried for 400 years to stop it. It's not ISIS now, or it's not the Sunnis, or it's not the Shias or whatever who tried to stop it. The West itself tried to stop it, particularly Catholicism tried to stop it. Protestantism then adjusted itself more, but Protestantism also tried to stop uh, Darwin, tried to stop Marx, tried to stop Freud, and so on. And all we got struggles of religion against those in the community who wanted to learn was then uh, uh, were lost. All we got struggles were lost. So, and even when sometimes religious people participated in that. So, for instance, the uh, Big Bang Theory was invented by a priest in Belgium, but that priest said that the Pope Pius XII could not use it in order to defend creationism. So, the split continues. Now, in us, there is a deep longing that we would get those two things together, but they are not together. The antagonism goes deeper and deeper all the time, as you can see from the culture wars. The culture wars, which you can see there on television every day, about almost everything. And so, uh, the, uh, so that is what we tried to make clear the last time, this antagonism, and it splits then also the religious communities, because some Jews uh, wanted to become modern. Other Jews wanted to stay with the Torah. And then they start fighting among each other, and that is a threat for Judaism. You have the same thing in Christianity. There is the Pope, Benedict XVI, and there is Hans Küng on the other side. One wants to open up to modernity, the other one wants to fight it. And you have the same thing in Islam, too, where you have people who want to stay with the Holy Quran, and others want to open up. And then those who want to open up get in trouble with those who are orthodox, and they start to fight each other, they kill each other, they cut their heads off. 
So you wear the same thing happened in the West. They cut a lot of heads off in the West and burned people. Giordano Bruno was burned. Others were discovered alive and, and so on. So you have the same struggle in all these world religions and it is still going on now. <laughs> okay, so, um, and of course, to be now dialectical, as we call that, does not only mean that you can remember where they were together, and that you see how they are apart now and how they cut their heads off, but also asking questions how it could be come together again in such a way that both sides can agree to it. Until they can agree, they should at least agree to disagree and not cut their heads off, because that is what they are still doing. Okay, so um, that was our uh, what we said the last time. Then we discussed Flint. <laughs> we, our main antagonism here in this uh, meeting is not so much the religion of the secular. We can always come back to this if you want to. But it is much more the class antagonism. So we had the movie there, and we saw that there is one class, workers, the auto workers, and so on. And then there is another class, the bourgeoisie. We saw that, right? We, yeah. And um, where where you have uh, G CEO, and he represents the owners. He is not the owners. He can be fired himself. So there is a very small class of 1%, which owns about 60%, 70% of all the wealth of the country. They have the power of super PACs. They can buy... The, um, the, the election, that you can see that, how this is happening right now. So um, uh, the uh, people may not want to know that they have a ruling class. They came into free country. There shouldn't be any ruling class, but there is one. So that is, and we saw that in Flint. Uh, we saw the, the houses and which are demolished and the workers, no jobs. And then we saw in the country club, I don't know if you saw the pictures, where the bourgeoisie is celebrating and has its own ideology, get up in the morning, the sun is shining, you have all the opportunities and all this horrible shit which these people produce, and there were even workers there who believed that. So when Reagan came and so on, they believed the whole story. That means the working class has the consciousness of the upper bourgeoisie and repeat that again and again and even vote according to it. And that at this moment they do not all vote about it. They went with the socialists on the left and with the fascists on the right. That means that this political system is destabilized at the moment. That means that the um, Republicans cannot neutralize the fascists and that the Democrats, can, the, the Democratic Party, cannot neutralize the, um, the uh, socialists. So, and how they will do that in the next days or month or so will be all decisive. And so, so um, okay, so we have this Flint story and there is a particular uh, bad issue there which we discussed because there is um, uh, some metal there, uh, lead in the water. It has threatened, it's threatening 6,000 children and uh, a few people have died already with the Legionnaires' disease which also comes from this and so on. So it is a crisis moment, and the question is now there is a neoliberal governor, and we read, I think, the story that uh, Michael Moore uh, wants him to be put into prison and uh, taken before court and so on, so, uh, which will probably not happen because uh, the people are not powerful enough to take him out. So, um, and, uh, so the, the, but the federal government has to come in. The whole system, their water pipes and so on, has all to be renewed, that would be billions of dollars just in one town. And so on. There are many towns who have similar problems, so um, the whole infrastructure is, is somehow has to be renewed. <laughs> okay, so that was what we did the last time, and uh, uh, then um, we saw the movie there, Roger and Me, so this is all behind us, and now we want to do a time diagnosis today. Um, is there anything which you would like to discuss? We uh, one thing which I wanted to bring up is yesterday I had two visitors from Saudi Arabia and uh, they came with a, with a camera and they took pictures here and we had a discussion on um, our uh, martyr who has been 
So, yes, yeah, just one month ago, I think. Yeah, so we remembered him and we made we made a movie uh, of it. We, yeah, we discussed him and uh, the two came from the village in the east of uh, of um, the country of a village, and they are even related to him. Uh, and so, therefore, they wanted to. They wanted to remember him yesterday, so. We did this here is this picture there, one picture so there is a better one, mm -hmm. and so they had ten questions, and we answered those questions, and we made a video out of it uh, and uh, so we can maybe very shortly um, discuss this issue in terms of the critical theory that means we use vocabulary we use the logic of the critical theory in order to understand what is going on, because it's far away from here, from the West. And um, the um, Sheikh Nimr al-Nimr, he was not very well known before 2000 or so. Um, it was during the Arabic Spring that he came somewhat into the foreground a little bit, but it was only in recent years. And uh, for us, um, it is not so much the Shiite Sunni Sunni government and the Shiite uh, uh, um, Sheikh, which is now in the center, but he was also very much committed to the poor in uh, Saudi Arabia, and um, then also the poverty of the uh, um, of the Shiite uh, minority and how they were treated. His grandfather had already uh, problems um, and and. Uh, ended badly, so it was somewhat in the family and it is in the shared minority in the east of Saudi Arabia um, which he presented. But this factor is of course important for us, that means they were not the rich people in the country, not the owners of the oil company, not the king's family or whatever, but the working class people and poor people whom he represented. So obviously in his life the class antagonism of the country, it's a class society, um, played an important role, and so he began to agitate against the government in the mosque, and uh, he was like Mahatma Gandhi, he was a non-violent person, he opposed violence, he didn't want to have any guns or shooting and so on, as far as his method is concerned, but he um, became more and more aggressive in his attacks against the uh, government because of the injustices against the poor and the injustices against the uh, Shiite minority. And so when he didn't stop and his rhetoric became sharper and sharper, they imprisoned him and then they sentenced him to death and together with 46 others he died. In the same year, last year, 150 people were deca decapitated by the government. So. Uh, we have a very tense situation and we discussed um, because there seems to be that by Sharia law, that means Islamic law on one side, there may be problems, but then also the human rights declarations which we have from 1776 and 1789 and, and then of the 20th century. The question is if he was treated adequately, um, if the trial was fair, um, it seems that the lawyers were not informed um, so that they could not defend him adequately. Now they don't give their body, his body out, the body cannot be buried. The government keeps the body and doesn't give it to the family. And um, so what is important for the administration of justice is that the accused has full rights and of defense and um, also that he is treated as a human being, that he is considered to be innocent until he is found guilty and so on. This is all the progress which we made on the secular side, but I think there is also progress which has been made on the religious side, and there may be something wrong how he has been treated even by Islamic law. So um, the, uh, he, he got the offer to apologize. Before they decapitated him, he could have uh, rescinded his uh, like Galileo once, and he could have rescinded, but he did not rescind. So he stood up with his uh, 
rhetoric and did not uh, diminish it in any way, and so then he was decapitated. So did he say he hasn't been buried? No, he hasn't been buried. The reason why is that they would make a big thing out of the burial. Probably it would be a public thing, and so they are. Uh, I asked the question, of course, you know, what condition the government is in, and if uh, to decapitate people is really part of, if that destabilizes the whole situation, because martyrs, and I called him a martyr of freedom, um, if the more martyrs you, uh, you create, the more dangerous it is. In the end, the martyrs win. The martyrs become more powerful after they are dead than they were before they were dead. So when you look in the history of Christianity, what the Inquisition did, the Inquisition continually burned people for centuries in order to preserve the unity of Europe, uh, the unity of faith, and in the end it was split into 1,200 groups here now. So you cannot, uh, do you make it only worse by doing that. So we uh, can also look through the eyes of the king um, whom he attacked and, and the government and we uh, try to see what the situation looks like for them that such a little man without guns and so on that he can be such a threat for him. There were also two youngsters, minor, who, minors who were killed as well and they have on death row another two people who are not yet 18 years old whom they also want to execute and so on. So this, uh, for, for, from the government point of view, it is not a very good situation to create uh, all these martyrs then, which only stimulates, you can see it from Christianity, 300 years of martyrdom and the Roman Empire was out, was down. So, um, and that is almost a uh, rule of thumb that um, if you try to repress the outcry for social justice, um, because of class oppression. Uh, he also was for democracy. Now that threatens the monarchy, of course. But it doesn't have to threaten it. That means the monarchy could become constitutional, like it is in England. So there is a middle way to say, you know, so uh, that the king opens up like the king of England did, like the, all the kings did in Europe, as far as they are there at all. You don't have to go to an outright republic you can have a democratic republic with a symbolical king if you want to, uh, but all the power lies with the uh, with, with parliament and uh, with the go uh, government. But um, so, but obviously the king is not willing to to do that neither. So, so there was an outcry for democracy, <coughs> outcry for <coughs> economic justice, which he represented, and um, and he did this all in a religious way. So he was not on the modern side of enlightenment and so on, but he t used the religious resources because the Holy Quran has something to say about the poor and what to do about the poor and so on. So also I think his idea of democracy or so was not necessarily Western. It was an idea of democracy and equality rooted in the Holy Quran itself. <coughs> okay, so do we have any... Um, the, uh, any uh, comment to this? Um, the two who were here, they thought that they want to do that in my class too in India, and they thought that their friends from Saudi Arabia would be afraid um, to say anything, and uh, I don't want to make anybody uh, afraid or whatever. I, I respect whatever is going on, and they were afraid that, that people could lose their support and that when they come home they would be treated badly and so on. So I hope that all that is not true and that is an exaggeration uh, and so, but um, you know, we, we don't want to um, bring any any endangerment for, for anybody. Rudy, do you think that that this opposition between the Saudi state and, and the Sheikh Nimr has something to do with the tensions between Iran and Saudi right now? Yeah. It came up, he was in Iran for some time, and uh, part of the accusation was that he was somewhat an agent of Iran. Iran. It came up, but uh, he said that was untrue. He had been in, uh, in Iran. Um, he also belonged to a certain group there, but then he uh, canceled it already there, so um, he defended himself. 
against that, that, that he was a sp spy for Iran or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the the issue with Iran and the you know the whole struggle uh, that certainly uh, that came up. Yeah, that's true. And it's interesting because uh, that's what brought the Shah down in Iran. Yeah, because he made so many martyrs. Right. So many exactly, Shahs doing yeah. because every so time you would kill someone, yeah. according to Islamic law, you have to be buried within 24 hours, within yeah. the next day, in the clothes yeah. that you're murdered in. Yeah. And so at each funeral, the next day would turn into a protest. Right. You exactly. kill ten people. Next day you have ten <coughs> protests. Yeah. Hundred people each. You kill ten people each. Next day you have a thousand. You know, yeah, people right, yeah. protest or whatever. I mean, yeah. so. What do you mean? Protest. Protest. Yeah. People coming out. You know, in. Uh, ah, like. Uh, against uh, the government, right? Mm -hmm. You know, okay. standing yeah. against the government. Mm -hmm. So. And that's what that's what brought the Shah down very yeah. quick. Like yeah. that's what unified the whole of the country against the Shah. You know. Yeah. The Bazaris were against the Shah. The, yeah, Iran. Yeah. The, the Imams were against the Shah. The workers were against the Shah. You know, the intelligentsia was against the Shah. Mm -hmm. Because of these yeah. martyrs. Because he killed yeah. so many people. The Shahidun. He yeah. made Shahidun. Yeah, yeah. But it is not only the person of the Shah and son. He was an agent of uh, Western mm -hmm. modernization. So that is important. Mm -hmm. um, which I don't know to what extent the... Uh, Saudi government is considered to be also friendly, open toward the West. Um, then, we, then we, yeah, the yeah, right. Yeah. And then we have we have to shift from the class antagonism over to the religious secular one again, so that we have in the same religious group trouble between those who open up toward the West and those who do not want to open up toward the West, and want to stick literally to the Holy Quran and so on. So that comes in. And the monarchy is more open towards the West yeah. than a lot of a the lot of people. Very conservative the people, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So that may come in. So uh, methodologically, we want to see if these categories of the good and the help us to understand that very confusing, you know, chaotic situation. Really, another thing which can help us, you know. So Iran came in, but um, what the present American government wants to do is to bring. Iran and Saudi Arabia together, whatever conflicts they have religiously or whatever, to bring them together in order to re-establish what we called already, I think, here the heartland theory, which means that since the 40s of the 20th century, there was a heartland theory which concentrated on the balance between Iran and Iraq. And so therefore the first Bush president, when he attacked Iraq, he did not go to Baghdad because he did not want to weaken the uh, Iran, Iraq further because the more he weakened Iraq, the stronger became Iran. So the balance of power there lies in that, that both of them balance each other. So when Iran became too strong, then the United States supported Saddam Hussein and gave him mustard gas even to attack, uh, to attack Iran and so on. When Saddam died, he said before he died, when he was already uh, shortly before his hanging, he said, be aware of the Persians and so on. So there was this antagonism between the Persians, which are the Iranians, and, and now the Persians, you know, are in Iraq and uh, uh, are more powerful than anybody else in Iraq. So, um, so this is in the background there of, of this whole tragedy of the, of the sheikh here. Um, now, if the American government will be will, uh, able to put that together again, Hitler tried to do that, and he failed. He was stopped in El Alamein in Egypt, and he was stopped in the Caucasus in Stalingrad, and therefore could not march to, uh, to Iran. The Iranians are not Semites. The Iranians are Aryans. So that plays a role in the whole thing as well. So they had an Aryan religion, Zoroastrianism, which then was overwhelmed in the seventh century by an Islamic by Islam, which is a Semitic religion. So that is, you know, the the background of the whole thing. So, but we don't have to go any further into that. Is there any comment as far as so? When I I'm glad to uh, you know to make those videos and so on, but I do not want that anybody becomes uncomfortable or that I endanger any students, uh, you know, support of, of their government and so on. Is this another YouTube video that we're going yeah, to Yeah, right, yeah, right. So. But it's not, it's not our friend Ahmed. No, you? no. Okay, someone else. Yeah, he comes from Iraq. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, um, 
Well, I mean, those those videos, you know, they have sometimes in one week, they had 3,500 hits in one week, and some of them have been translated into Arabic in Egypt. They have been translated, and obviously there is a great interest for, for them. Yeah, but we have to see, you know, what, what the reaction is. Okay, so that about our sheikh, and um, from, from the critical theory point of view, he is a martyr of freedom, like Kennedy would be, and, and so on. Um, and even what he thinks of democracy and social justice and so on uh, is not secular. It is nevertheless very serious and very beautiful, I think. So that is what we have expressed in the, in the videos. Okay. Um, ah, there's our genius. He's here. Good. Very good. Okay. Uh, you can, if you want to have it there, you can sure. look at it. And uh, Okay. Now, maybe we can have one more uh, contemporary issue, and that is the election which is going on now, and see if the categories of the critical theory, as we apply to this, if we can make sense of what is happening tonight. So, um, the, oh my God, what is this? Uh, it's, uh, Are we hungry? It's, it's, uh, like others. Oh, good, so wonderful, please. yeah. Okay, <laughs> you can... Thank you, thank you so very much. So, um, the what what is going on here in America? So we move from Saudi Arabia to to our situation here. Um, last night, Trump had won, and uh, also the uh, uh, Bernie Sanders has won. So um, we we know all the facts. We can start with the analysis right away. So when we have the continuum from the left to the right. We have a social uh, socialist, a democratic socialist that is something like in Denmark and Norway and Sweden and so on. It's sometimes called social democratic party, sometimes it's called labor party, and uh, so that we have on one extreme. And then we have two liberal positions: the Roosevelt liberalism, which is uh, the, the, um, the uh, Mrs. Clinton. And then we have also neoliberals. There are about three or four neoliberals running at the same time. And then we have on the far right, we have uh, fascism. So um, the, uh, the uh, Trump fellow, his last word was that he will introduce waterboarding again and that he will do something much more terrible than waterboarding. Now, it's one way that you do it secretly, like the Bush administration did and so on, or if you are proud of it, they were at least ashamed of it and tried to stop it. So, but uh, Obama tried to stop it. I don't even know if he stopped it. But you know, sometimes you can act like a fascist without being a fascist. But if you like it and you confess to it and you make it your policy in public, then you are a fascist. And there are other elements, a strong nationalistic element, making America great again and so on. There are racist elements, the uh, people out there from Mexico and people from the Near East and so on. These are all fascist tendencies. I don't think that he himself has a consistent fascist theory, but we, um, uh, it is more unconscious. But uh, what is very important when we look at this is that it is not so important if somebody is a man or a woman or if he is black or white or whatever. But the most important thing is that there is a theory which may be more or less conscious or unconscious. So when you see Bernie talk, when you hear Bernie talk, and you hear Mrs. Mrs. Clinton talk, there are two different theories. One is Roosevelt liberalism, the other one is socialism. And uh, that is now very dangerous. In the last two days or so, they mention Bernie very, uh, very seldom, because it is not very, un it's very uncomfortable. The President Clinton had a horrible face when he was shown recently uh, because of this disappointment. But it's not only the disappointment. The um, liberalism, the Roosevelt liberalism, was a way for the United States to keep socialism out. And if socialism breaks through, that is catastrophic because they take the wind out of the sail of, of liberalism. So it is a struggle of life and death between those two. And that he has all the young people, that he has young women uh, particularly, who should go to Clinton. There was Albright, the former Secretary 
stage who she said that you know the all these young women who do not support a woman candidate should go to hell and so on um so this you see how sharp that is that means they are much more uh, endangered by bernie than they are by trump because uh, it is that what they always pretended to do and didn't do it and so that bernie points out that she is paid by wall street that means she is paid by the ruling class takes all the bottom out of her camp so she got 15 million dollars from wall street from big business i mean from the ruling class and people uh, somehow are opposed to that ruling class without really knowing it but bernie talked about it all the time so um that is a fierce type of a struggle and they will do everything to stop bernie by uh, also the anchor man so, you, so when you go to ms what is it NB, msnbc msnbc so that is a roosevelt liberal station and they have begun in weeks to agitate against bernie there all the time and took the side of clinton and so on so and underneath this political struggle so bernie makes a political revolution there is the class antagonism now that means there is a whole class of 250 million people and that's all you know because you seldom will meet any kind anybody from the bourgeoisie here or not from the high bourgeoisie at all Karamasu doesn't have the high bourgeoisie they have only the middle bourgeoisie so a little bit under Ken under the kennedys or so but the kennedys are still middle bourgeoisie they are not high bourgeoisie so um the people whom you know are most from the working class or from the low bourgeoisie in the stores or whatever so um uh, that uh, it is this group there to which bernie now has made contact who have never had a party well not they they were parties they are socialist parties in detroit they are trotskyists and uh, other groups there but they speak a language which nobody understands really and they are very small and um, are prisoners of their own vocabulary in a certain sense so but bernie was able to to break through and so he is also paid he has more money now than clinton has but it comes all from those little people who pay $27 uh, uh, one person and of course they can go on forever to pay this $27 every month so he is well he's the money to to do it because you need a lot of money they have probably spent 1 billion dollars altogether here we collect toilet paper in the church every sunday to get toilet paper into the slums here north of the uh, of the of the oil station and they spend 1 billion dollars just for for advertisement and propaganda and so on so yeah what 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 makes it uh, uncontrollable the the social and the liberal model why they cannot live together or why why one either of these or that well i mean the, let's see the two sides so we have a certain form of liberalism so it's not the neoliberals which you have the other candidates uh, on, on who fight against uh, trump there the the liberalism here was of course they were all like these neoliberals in the 18th century or 19th century but with the great depression and already before by 1900 there was the first roosevelt the, the roosevelt and he was the vice chair vice mayor of new york and new york had a horrible rebellion that means the people from manhattan marched up to their landlords and burned their houses down and killed them and so the roosevelt the vice mayor um put it down the upheaval but he also learned something from it and so by 1900 he asked already for health care for national health care and he asked also for the fed that means for intervention of the state into civil society to curb the greed to uh, uh, regulate and and so on and so on and then uh, mckinsey was mckinsey mckinsey the president was assassinated mckinley 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 was assassinated and they had made roosevelt the vice president so that he would be out of the way because the vice president has nothing to say so um therefore and now mckinley the mckinley mckinley was assassinated so he became president 
And right away he went with Rockefeller and Carnegie and so on. He all tracked them before the courts, and they were all divided up. They were dismantled. And the same thing Bernie wants to do too with Wall Street and so on. So the dismantlement, uh, where the uh, anti-monopoly laws, uh, you can put them all on trial. Why? What? What illegal they do for Wall Street? Illegal was that they were monopolies. Mm -hmm. There is an anti-monopoly law in the United States. So they get so big, for instance, the fireplace here, right? Uh, it's a monopoly which produces those things. And so they said, we cannot repair it, you need a new one. And I cannot go to anybody else. So that's a monopoly. But it's maybe a Kalamazoo monopoly or Michigan monopoly, that's a small one. But the big monopoly, couple, they cover the whole country. So therefore every president can do that. And if he would come, you know, he would do that, he would dismantle that. But the uh, the uh, also very liberal Obama, you see, was to nationalize the banks, and instead of nationalizing them, he nationalized their debts. There you see the difference between, uh, 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 you know, uh, you the also very liberal, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Nationalizing so the making the money for the for the poor, even if the poor pay the money, and the difficult. Right. Exactly. They, they bailed out the state banks who cheated them before. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. liberalism. And that is what Bernie now hooks all the time, you know, and she has nothing, Clinton has nothing to say about it. So, but socialism now, the other side. So on one side we see we have this modified, because the second Roosevelt, he modified uh, liberalism more. So liberalism is an atomistic theory. It's a fo originally Protestant theory, and it means the individual should do his own thing. He should work, he should become entrepreneur and so on. So the emphasis is on the on the individual, and the state has to be kept small, a night watchman uh, position, and so on. So that's what you have on the further the neoliberals preach that all the time. But this was the social state. Was the, this was hmm? Marx wanted. Hmm? This was the, the movement point as well to minimize the power of the state. The no, no, no. That's a completely different story, Marx. Yeah. He comes from liberalism, yes, but. Let me just, is there any question? Do we have a question over there? We don't want to have him talking all the time. Yes. <laughs> we need equality. Yes, please. Democracy. Yep. Yes, okay. I agree with you. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, I, I, I don't agree too fast yeah, now. I'll say that's not very yeah. democratic. Okay. <laughs> but let me, just, let me just explain those things. So, um, so we have a modified liberalism under Roosevelt because of the Great Depression. So the capitalist system broke down, he had to modify it with a new deal. So what did he do? So liberalism, pure liberalism means that everybody on his own, right? I am self-interest. I follow my self-interest. I step on the others if necessary. You know, I'm the businessman. I eat up all the others and so on. That's liberalism. It's also closely connected with Darwinism and so on. So the you know, power of the stronger and the fittest and survival of the fittest and all that can come in and in fascism it all comes in. So, But now Roosevelt added to that, yes, you should take care of yourself, but what if you can, if the capitalistic system has broken down, what are we doing then? Well, then the family has to come in. What if they can do it? The city and the county and the state and finally the federal government has to come in. So he brought together social workers on one side and capitalist tycoons on the other side, and they together formed that New Deal thing. And they brought religion in too, they brought the Pope in, namely the uh, encyclical letter, social encyclical letter, Quattragesimo Anno. That means 50 years after Marx, finally the religious people discovered that something was wrong with capitalism. So they wrote these encyclicals and they still write them today to the present Pope. We talk about on Friday, right? So, and they introduce a principle of subsidiarity. That means if you, as an individual, you cannot help, you cannot study, your parents don't have the money, and so on, then you must be helped. So then the state has to pay the whole thing, or the capitalists have to pay the whole thing, whatever. So that is subsidiarity. And when you see in New Orleans, you know, where you have then a neo conservative president who doesn't take serious subsidiarity or solidarity anymore, then he acts in a certain way. So therefore it is so important, not if somebody is a man or woman or black or white, but what theory he has. That means what is in his brain, not the cells of the brain. 
for the thoughts which the brain can produce. So he did not have that principle anymore, subsidiarity and such. So therefore he thought that New Orleans and the states, they should take care of that storm. So the storm got bigger and bigger because the sea was so warm, and so the harbor storm hit. And he thought the buses, the school buses, are what should take care of it. That is liberalism again. Liberalism as it was before Roosevelt. And so since that was missing, the storm came and the, it was a catastrophe. There were some helicopters which flew over it and rescued some cats on a roof and so on, while 1,500 people were dying in the process. So if he still had had that thing in his head of Roosevelt's liberalism, uh, liberalism, this theory, is a system of categories, of sentences, of conclusions and so on. If he still had had that in his brain, then he would say, I have all these pontoons in the desert, you know, thousands of them from the Second World War, when they stormed the Normandy. They are all standing in the desert, they are rotting away and so on. They can swim and they can thrive. He could have a thousand of them sent into the city and they could have rescued everybody in the city and so on. So, instead of that, you know, people gathered somewhere in a stadium and have nothing to eat and no toilets and so on and so on. There you see why theories are so important. If you have a socialist theory or liberal theory or fascist theory, it makes all the difference. Even if the guy who has the theory has it only instinctually and doesn't write a book on it like Mussolini did or like Hitler did or whatever. Okay, so, um, so that is the liberal thing and this is what we see. You see that happening because the theory comes out, becomes manifest, in the words which people speak, the positions which they take, the faces which they make, you know. When, when Bernie comes and said, you've got $15 million from Wall Street and so on, the face she makes and so on, and the face he makes or whatever. So, and for instance, the thing, it becomes even philosophical. The, uh, the, uh, the liberal, uh, also a liberal, Mrs. Clinton says, you know, I have experience, I have experience. Then comes Bernie and says, experience is good, but you also need judgment. And the judgment was missing because she voted for the criminal war against Iraq, and Bernie did not. She voted for war against Libya, which is her real crime, not, not the ambassador, whatever she may have done wrong, that she got into, into this war in the first place. Without war declaration or whatever, together with the British and France, and bombed the hell out of Gaddafi, you know. So um, that was the crime. That was the lack of judgment. So you see, the, so uh, theory is a system of sentences, of principles, of conclusions, of judgments, and so on. And what kind of a theory you have in your head, even if it's not conscious, that gives direction to your actions and motivations to your actions, and so on. Okay, so now the socialist thing, we, we sh show the genesis of uh, liberalism, of this Roosevelt liberalism. That's the best what Americans can get now, or until Bernie came. It's the new liberalism. It's, it's not, well, it's because Roosevelt, that was 100 years ago, by the way. Because the new social modified liberalism. The social modified liberal goes back to the 40s, right? The, 30s and the 40s. So <coughs> President Roosevelt did not have to do what Hitler did, ask for the emergency laws and dictatorship. Instead of that, he replaced it by the New Deal. So that was it. So now the other side, you know, the, the, there's Bernie and there is Ms. Clinton. So you see it even, the theory is marching around. The theory has become incarnated. It has become flesh in these two people. And it does not matter if one is now 74 years old or the other 60 years old or whatever what theory they have in their head, that is important. And also the anchor man, you know, the, the, the pandits and so on, what theories they have in their head, that counts. So what the critical theory teaches us is to look for that, you know, and not to get distracted if he has the right tie on. Mm, last night the, the two bought me a tie. <laughs> they put a tie on me so that I would look good in that movie or so. Well. These outside things, they may, of course, they also have their, you know, a socialist maybe should look good too, and, and so on. But, but why? Because people are so damn and superficial that it makes sense if she smiles or whatever, you know, because they cannot look through the whole thing, what is behind 
the the mask and the behavior and the appearance and so on, and which which uh, justifies what they are doing later on too. The justification. So now Bernie is a democratic socialist. So you brought in Marx again. So the um, he is not a communist. What is the difference? There are socialists which want to go to communism, and there are socialists which do not want to go to communism. So the socialists, uh, the, and they were also tremendously hostile. So uh, Stalin ordered the Communist Party in Germany to fight not against the fascists, but to fight against the Social Democrats, the Bernie people, right? Because these, uh, so these people, by making social reforms, by giving free schooling or free hospital and so on, make the capitalist system last longer. So if you really want to finish that system up, then vote for Trump, you know, or vote for all those who try to undo them. They will finish it up fast. But if you take the others, even the Roosevelt liberals, you know, they have kept that thing going because the tension, the antagonism between the classes is mitigated somewhat. So, so that they don't burn down the cities, which they have done anyway. They have burned down Detroit. They have done, burned down in Los Angeles. They have burned down Miami, etc. Even in the middle of the war, they have burned down Detroit. So, in order to keep the class system halfway harmonious, you give them milk powder, or you give them Social Security, or Medicare, or whatever. So, um, so the, um, somehow, there may be a similarity between the, the Roosevelt liberals and the, uh, uh, the democratic socialists. So, the, the uh, communists, so-called communists, so we had them in Russia, we had them in Cuba, and uh, in Venezuela, and in North Korea, and in China, and so on. For them, socialism uh, constitutes certain steps toward communism. And um, on these steps, you still have a ruling class. You still have the dictatorship of the proletariat. That means the present dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, because they have not even an opposition party. So the present dictatorship of the bourgeoisie in this country is broken by a dictatorship of the proletariat. So the 250 million workers here would establish some their own government and they would de expropriate the capitalists, they would maybe hang the capitalists, or they would uh, force them to, would send them to work. That's what they do in China. And the most horrible thing for a capitalist is to work. That's what he wants to get out of in the first place. So if you sentence him to work in China, they committed suicide. They, they sentence themselves. I, if I may ask, what's different then in this way there are like type, three types of socialism. One is the democratic socialism, the second is the, the communist. No, there are only two, and really. And the third is the fascist, like it. Yeah, but the fascists have little to do with socialism. National socialism. No, national no. Socialism. Okay, we can explain that too, but let's see that we have the one side. So we have a continuum, right? We want to make it visible for ourselves. And now we talked on one side, this democratic socialism, then there comes this the Roosevelt liberalism, then there comes the neoliberalism, and then comes the fascism, right? So the, that means when civil society, because of the stronger going up and the weaker going down, and the salaries of one side going up or the income higher and higher, and the others go down and down, according to the news book from France, we have a discrepancy of income which is worse than it was in Marx's time. So when that happens, then people feel this is injustice going on. Then socialism is born. That is where, where this fellow comes from, Bernie. And then when socialism comes from, then you have on the other side fascism. The fascists then have to kill the socialists. They started in New York already to kill them by 1880. I have it in these three volumes up there, where I describe the workers going to the funeral and so on. So, um, and of course, then the liberals do that, and the Catholics do that, and the, uh, and the fascists do that. They all three hate communism. So they kill, as the, the best killer is the fascist. And this is the rough guy there, you know, he wants to have waterboarding. I cannot even imagine, he says, much worse than waterboarding. Does he know what waterboarding is? It pushes you to the boundary of, of uh, death, and you never know what they will do with you, and so it's the most all the torture you can think besides crucifixion. And Cruz said that it's not torture. Yeah, right. That, that, was, the, that was the fairy tale of the, of the Roosevelt liberals, too. So, 
Okay, so this is the, that means you have liberalism, you have this horrible class antagonism in liberalism, then comes socialism and say, we have enough of it, it's enough, we don't want to have that anymore, the billionaire class, and so on, all the way, the way goes for a friend. And then comes the other side now, that means to rescue what is threatened by socialism. So fascism is the exact opposite of socialism. So fascism is a kind of corporatism. Liberalism. It's corporatism, yeah. It's liber liberalism, but the one that no, it's, co it's uh, Mussolini called it corporatism. That means it's a marriage of the government and the corporations. So we have that to a large extent anyway, always through lobbying and, and so on. So it's, it takes almost nothing. It takes a month to make the American system into a fascist system. So, but but it's important now where they are coming in, right? So you have El Salvador, you have uh, the Arena Party, which is a fascist party, which fights against the socialists, which fight against the horrible injustice of the coffee industry where people, you know, s uh, collect that coffee which you drink every morning and get almost nothing for it and you pay this high price here for a Starbucks or whatever. So it's like uh, in the middle we have the, the socialism and the liberalism and then the, from both sides there are the extreme ones. So the ex extreme from the liberalism would be fascism. fascism. And from the socialism, also the extreme one would be like the the dictatorship of the that was in the Yeah. Well, I mean, we just want to see our scene now here, what we have, right? Yeah. So we have a, we don't have a, a communist here. I mean, we have communists in the cities, in Detroit and so on, but they are not running, you know. But the, uh, the democratic socialist runs, you know, they are really there, and the fascist is running on the other side. And then you have those two forms of liberalism, an older one, which goes back to the 18th century, and the newer one, which goes back to the 19th century. That is the scene, as you can see it, visible with your eyes, because the critical theory is empirical, right? It's not only your understanding operating or reason operating by itself, a priori or so, but it is very much down to, you know, the Adorno did all these uh, sociological studies about personal authority, uh, 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 pers personal authoritarian personality and so on, which are with questionnaires and, you know, 7,000 forms did that in Frankfurt and so on. So they are very empirical. So it's not something fun, fun, uh, fancying up, but the empirical, what the senses think is connect it with understanding, that means with the separation of things, and also with dialectical reason. So these two, like Bernie said, experience is good for judgment. So there are these two elements, right? Judgment comes from somewhere else. That's the whole set of principles and so on and so on. And that is connected then to the experience, the facts and the data which the positivists are always uh, collecting, right? So in, in the sociology department, right? So th that is, our sociology department is completely qualitative, but they also allow qualitative studies still, which is always nice, and that's why we had all these PhDs today. Okay. Okay, any question about our time diagnosis now? Do, our, our, do we all know what we are doing? Sure. <laughs> okay, <laughs> do we have any questions still? Why are you all Such a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> Don't agree with me now. <laughs> Say no. Oh, uh, no, I will understand that. The more you disagree with them, the better the great. Yeah, the better, the better you is. So yeah. we're going to start yeah. socialism? Right now. <coughs> what what was that? that? Socialism. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 What? We know, like, uh, we have like different thing, different two theories, like socialism and fascism. Liberalism. Liberalism. Fascism. Yeah. So, in the kingdom, do you all have universal health care? Do you, do you have to pay for your to go to the hospital? No. 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 Okay. no it's free. Now, if you go to university in the kingdom, is it paid for? Yes. It's paid for. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. if you get sick and you have to eat some pills, are they paid for? Yeah. In Germany. In Germany too. See, in Saudi, in Germany, in this France, this in morning, in Sweden, in Norway. Yeah. yeah. This morning, no. uh, no. So how how can like the the government, United States government, because you know this way is because to make the government to still life, right? Mm -hmm. To make the kingdom still like going live or to going longer, right? 
but in the United States it's, they didn't have this ways and this till longer. So how? Right. right. Well, how? This is what Bernie is trying to bring. Yeah. yeah. Right. What what you have there, you know, we yeah. don't have it. And yeah. Is, you yeah. know, right. mm -hmm. the, people lose their house. They get thrown out of their house because yeah. they can't pay their medical bills. Yeah. They they becoming like homeless. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, let's all bring in. Are we all together? Do we? Did yeah, you have a question or? No, we discussed about it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's all talk together. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Very good. Okay. So, um, well, this uh, uh, this morning I had a girl in class and I had a test. So she said, "I have such a horrible cold. I cannot do the test." I said, "Well, then go to Sinecure, Sin Sinecure, whatever to the hospital yeah. there." <laughs> so uh, she said, "I have no money. I cannot pay." I said, "I pay for you." So just go. She couldn't understand that I would pay for her and that she should go. If somebody is sick and cannot go because there is no money, that drives me nuts. Yeah. The Germans have that since 1870. Mm -hmm. And here it is now 2016. It is still there. So we have an unbelievable social backwardness. But now you have to see the reason why that is because there is no Labour Party. Who's that American? Hmm? American student, yeah. Yeah, health center. Health center, yes, good health center, yeah. But she told you, she told you, you don't have, he didn't, she didn't have insurance or couldn't yeah, pay, right? she couldn't, she has no money. She you know did. some people who have no insurance at all, we didn't have to pay anything. Sometimes they, in yeah. hospitals, they have indigent care. Yeah. So if you are, you don't have any money, you yeah. still, you see, in the U.S., you still have access to the yeah. care. But if you can't pay for it, then other people have to pay for it. Yeah. Oh, you know, and, and, and the oh. hospitals get bankrupt, like the hospitals down there, right. because there are all these uninsured people, but they don't want to let them lay on the street. Right. But they, these people never know if they will be accepted or not. See, the doctors here, who are liberals there, they say, we will take care of that. We will take care of this, you know. Now, they have 40 million old people here. How can they take care of 40 million old people, you know? And I was once sitting there down there, and a woman comes in, 75 years old, and she said, I cannot pay this $80 anymore. I, I have nothing to eat next week if I pay this. And the doctor went, disappeared again, came out, and she came again. I cannot pay. And she went on as long as I was sitting there, a whole hour, you know. So sometimes she, he said, you know, I, I cannot pay everything, you know. I, I do so much already, you have to pay yourself. And so. so it's entirely arbitrary if you get it or not. So if she would have gone, probably, and she would have said, I have no money, they maybe would have treated her. Maybe not. It is up to those people there. If they say, we have helped so many already, then they don't do it. And so, and so, so, but, I mean, the reason for that is if there is no Labour Party and you have only two bourgeois parties, you know, that's what you have to expect. You know. But so, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in the United States, we have the, like many programs to take care about the poor people. No, the government, I think there is no uh, program. There is volunteer like uh, George uh, and Cher, and they volunteer to buy this for the homeless and give them the food, uh, food supplies, anything. But free in the government, no. No, right, really. it's mostly private. Oh, private really? Charity. But they have like private shelter private. for uh, for uh, homeless, right? For religious people, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, religious so, people, yeah. but that's civil society. So groups okay. within civil society, not the state, but within civil society, produce you know oh, the shelters. Okay, and not the state. Yeah, the but, state, but, but I mean, the state. Okay. Yeah. But that shows you that capitalism doesn't that's work. Right. Money, yeah. Yeah. If right. if capitalism cannot get enough toilet paper down to the south, that means capitalism doesn't work. It has an easier time to d to develop a Cadillac, you know, luxury article, than to get toilet paper to the people there. Yeah, mm. If they have to have unemployment, that means the businessmen are not job creators. They are lying. Mm -hmm. They are doing they're not uh, creating enough job. Five people, five percent or whatever, that is millions of people have no jobs. So mm -hmm. the capitalist system doesn't work, right? It's not the state which has to create the jobs. It's the the businessmen who don't have don't uh, so. What they thought in liberalism is that private people would make insurance companies, mm -hmm. uh, health insurance and so on, but they had 200 years and they didn't do it. And that the, uh, that the churches have to do it means also that capitalism doesn't work mm -hmm. because it's not the task of the church to create jobs or to feed people or whatever. It's the businessmen people. So 
Civil society is neat system, administration of justice, police, and professional organizations. So the neat system, that has to be taken care of. People have to be fed and clothed, etc. That is the task of the businessman. Mm-hmm. Now, when I ask my son, who is a businessman, for instance, I say, well, uh, um, you know, you have to start to think of the needs first, and then you have to see if you can fulfill this need. So what kind of a need do you want to fulfill? And he said, if I would have thought that way, I wouldn't have become a businessman. I said, what the hell did you think of? <laughs> that means they think, you know, they come on and say, this is a $5 billion corporation. I'm not interested, five, but I'm interested if they fulfill whatever that is, their food, for instance, if they are food producers. But they make people fat. They cannot even feed. Some of them, they give no food. The others won't give the wrong food. You know, all these uh, damn hamburgers there, which make people sick all over the place. So they are not doing their job, right? Yeah, right. Right. So, and that is where then socialism comes in. That is why Bernie is there, because people are fed up, in spite of the fact that they are not theoretically not really aware of all these things. They feel that something is wrong in the state of Denmark, you know. I, I think yeah. the problem not just for the health care. Hmm? The problem, not the problem just so all the people have the health care. There is a problem like for, for us, uh, if we have uh, go to the hospital in our country mm-hmm. or any Arabic country, the bill is full, it's lower price. price than here for uh, different, big different levels. So here, if I just take a blood uh, test, it's my uh, my bill has five hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. But in our country, just fifty real, so just uh, mm-hmm. like uh, ten dollars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think this is the big issue. Why yeah. the medicine here yeah. is so yeah. high? Now, in your country, who is responsible for that? Who made that law? No, the government. The government has the hospital, but there is like private hospital if you want to. Yeah. So you have two choices. Right. But I mean, as far as the hospital. state is concerned, who made the law? Do you have a party which made those laws? Just for the, the king. Did the king do that? The king and the, the like king, yeah. they have... Uh, yeah. 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 The council is for the king. Yeah. For example, I don't know what happened really there. Yeah. But they have they said you have to 
buy something, but not like a uh, big price, like, uh, for example, 20 percent, yeah. 15 percent from the bus. Affordable, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if the government does that, so the king or whoever, you don't have a party who fought for this, so that you have it now? Like no, 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 you cannot uh, put the medicine uh, <laughs> by, uh, by money. All the, all the uh -huh. citizens have to, have to go to the uh, hospital yeah. as a street, as a department. Yeah. But, but there must be a law, right, that every citizen can get that, that every citizen has free education. We have to have the, like, uh, here, here they have a social security. Right. I have to have, if I have the my card, my ID, as at yeah. all the uh, right. citizens, I can't yeah. be. Right. If I don't have, maybe yeah. I am a citizen, yeah. but Who's I don't have. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have right. Okay, but who made that law that Amer every oh. citizen... Oh, many years ago with the king. Yeah, yeah, I know, but who did it? I mean, the king. Maybe Malik Malik yeah. Malik okay, king but if the king did it, did he do it out of religious reasons? That all on the Holy ah, Quran or Sharia yeah. law, it's everybody it's has the right it's to get that. Was it religious or was there socialists or communists or yeah, who did this? religious motivation. Yeah. It was a secular yeah. one. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, is the king a religious figure or is he a secular figure? Secular figure. Secular. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's about, the whole thing is about, they have all power and they have control the money and we don't want to have citizens but I mean, it's, it's interesting that that the king, you know, makes such that they do have such progressive type of legislation because it is progressive. You know, it's more progressive than here. So the question is where where that comes from. Do the British have something to do with it? Or? I think the British uh, the British the tax. They have a, a higher tax more than me. Yeah. So from the money uh, taken from the tax, they can give the good health, health insurance. Yeah. That's what I read before, like one year. Yeah. yeah. So no. British. Yeah. yeah. So it's a it is a British model still. No, yeah. I think. Uh, let me tell you the truth. Is <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. He has the truth now. Okay. Yeah, he has the no, truth. He has the truth. Go ahead. Maybe I spend yeah. part of my life in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I live there. I know very good the situation. Yeah. Okay. The thing is, the thing is, nobody knows there knows in fact real how how the British model was at all. Yeah. But everybody there, out of pure religious reasons, they think that the state is responsible for our for our trade, yeah. our food, our medication, so on. This how. Muslims think because we have a big figure in Muslim history, the like Omar Khattab, this guy. Mm -hmm. Everybody, every normal person there knows that he was paying everybody who was poor, feeding people, and so on. So this, my yeah. idea is very clear, very strong in the mind of every Arab. Yeah. I think the state is responsible for us. This yeah. was the same in Egypt. Okay, then country. it would be religious after all, right? It's a religious part. religious solidarity. So the, the king yeah. knows but that. But it's not saying the Quran. Yeah. No. The Quran said just help poor people. It's right. not oh. called to access or the food no, or the hospital. Or just help. Well, well, the the yeah. This common knowledge between normal people. Uh, you know that Omar al Khattab used to feed those who have money, give them and so on. Okay. Even Christians and Jews. Mm. So this is what everybody is saying. Yeah. The king knows that the people know, know it, mm. and they talk about it, so he wants to protect himself by giving them that, yeah. not to let them say where is where are our rights or so on. Right, okay. 
So, I mean, one of the pillars, right, is to take care of the poor or whatever, yeah, whoever yeah. wants to get money from it. it they might ha have it, but it's nobody in, in Northern Saudi, Egypt, nobody knows about that. Yeah, nobody uh, nobody has I, that in mind. Yeah, that is not Only educated, very educated people yeah, will be one for them. Yeah, I really many uh, or British talk about the how, how it's worked in British. So they said uh, they have uh, high level uh, tax, so they buy the tax, and they, as I buy the tax, taxes, you have to give me the health insurance, you have to give me a good life, sorry. So they get that for their money, even they, they realize they have by the tax of the thing, but they didn't get anything. Just a good road, good surface, but no medicine. There was flood in uh, Egypt in 1996, and then the President Mubarak went to the poor people who was hitting with that, and a very, a very poor man said to him, where at the time when, the, when Omar said, if, if my donkey was set <laughs> to in the way, God would ask the king why you didn't uh, pave the road for right. it. And the president said, look, I really didn't do this plan for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's come to a conclusion about our contemporary issues. Um, we tried, first of all, to look at... Okay, you have a little spy thing there. No, no, it's the king's microphone. It's the king's microphone. Okay. Did you record me? Yesterday they came. Oh my God! Openly. You didn't he get does it. Any permission? <laughs> yeah, my didn't permission. You didn't get it. He's recording too. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh! But well, I've been recording, recording him for twenty some years. Oh, so I'm yeah. gonna, uh, I'm gonna be famous. <laughs> <laughs> famous <laughs> and infamous. 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 Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's sum it up before we do the next thing. So we had bed. First of all, we had the. Uh, the shake, and then we have this American situation now, Bernie, and I think we explained it somehow. Um, so this continuum, right, with the different groups, we try to make the different groups clear, and what the function is in an overall capitalistic system. So, and that is very important, because that is how it happened in the 20th century, how Hitler, Mussolini, Franco, and all this happened, and how it has happened now in El Salvador again now, the new wave now of the same thing how it happened in Argentina when the Pope was there and so on. So um, that means the, the uh, uh, civil society cannot fulfill the needs adequately by these capitalistic, individualistic arrangements. If it is health insurance or the food industry or the housing or whatever. So on top of it, you have the financial disaster where suddenly people who had a house don't have a house, where they had savings and these savings have disappeared. So. That means why um, Sanders, Sanders wins now is not a little tactical thing. So the Clinton thinks if I had only done this, or if he had been earlier here, or if my husband would have, that is all accidental and contingent. She is losing because her liberalism has left history behind, or history has left her behind. <laughs> If that happens, whatever strategy you do, it will not help any longer. So, and that is true for the neoliberals too. Call and from that is Barbo why, Associa. why this Trump leaves, them, leaves the others all behind there. Call so, from Barbo Associa. Yeah, that is my daughter. Can you do it? You can't take your time. Yeah, can you answer yeah. over there? Can you say we are working hard? Uh. <laughs> okay, so what what the critical theory adds two things is to take the empirical stuff seriously but then hey, try to uh, synthesize it. I'm trying to get hold of you. I will try. Tell her we are. Okay. My children have it much better than I have. So. Oh. Okay, so so what th that we can look through the data as the positivists do um, as they deliver them, that we look through them, through the categories, and understand the whole thing better. So the uh, civil society, the liberal society, with its individualism and atomism and so on, produces these social inequalities, these injustices, 
then comes the uh, socialists in, and then they try to rescue the capitalistic system by bringing uh, the the fascist in. In this case, the fascist is even one of the billionaires and so on. There is another one, Bloomberg. He may come into the one in order to replace. Uh, see, both parties are supposed to be to stabilize. So the vice president is ready to jump in when Clinton continues to to lose so that he can neutralize Bernie. He has to get out. They have to get him out, you know. And on the other side, the, uh, they try Bloomberg, who was the mayor of New York, also a billionaire. They will bring him in in order to neutralize the, um, the, uh, the Trump. So you see how desperate the system is, right? The normal idea is to balance it and to have two bourgeois, two capitalistic parties, and they shift, uh, they transfer power uh, every four years, and that is about it. So, uh, so, but it doesn't work this time, and that is why all the pandits are in this in this uproar. That means the two parties do not do what they are supposed to do: to neutralize the fascist on one side, to neutralize the socialist on the other side. And so, they, but they have Plan B, and the Plan B is that they will draft somebody. They will draft the vice president and neutralize Bernie if he should. They still waiting. They trapped Bloomberg in order to neutralize the other one. But they hope that maybe those three who are left will still kill him off. But if they don't do, then they will trap Bloomberg. So, so that's how the system operates. But how did it get into that shape? You know, Because of the underlying class system. The 250 million who produce all the wealth of this country are disenfranchised. They have no worker party or whatever. This fellow there, this Bernie, he uh, does not even belong to the Democratic Party, and he has no Labour Party on the basis of which he wants. That's a most peculiar type of a thing. So, and we'll see how this is settled. They want to restabilize it, and they have both have this Plan B, and they hope that they will not have to go to Plan B, but that Plan A will take care of it. That Bernie will lose. And you can see how they do it on the air there, by just not mentioning him or, uh, or talking for Clinton and so on. And the others talk for the other one who could maybe take care of... of uh, so you can see from day to day, from minute to minute, how this whole system, this whole machinery, how it is struggling with the present crisis. And the basis of the crisis is the horrendous inequality that, for instance, the CEO may earn 300 times more than the guy who does the real work in, in the company. So um, that, that may be enough for, that is the analysis which we can deliver on the basis of the critical theory. Right? Okay. okay, now we make a pause for the cookies. Okay. Cookie pause. Cookie pause. I got this pause. You like this?
with it. I think that some are actually going to be able to pay. Five hundred people to pay. Well, I'm already full time. So these are some things that they don't have to pay. But they have to pay it anyway if they don't want to. They have to pay the fee. So then they do it anyway. So it is much more orderly way if they choose. Small teaching loads because there it's four classes a semester. Okay. Well, I'm well, I'm 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 ضد ولي الامر ولك الرضا 
and he um, then left that and joined the Frankfurt School and um, then came the student upheaval and it was so wild that he lost his nerves so he became ill he could never teach again but he continued to do research and I visited him several times so um, where you have a connection he was um, he wrote his dissertation under Horkheimer and Adorno about the theodicy the theodicy for instance when you say um, why does that bad thing happen to me because of secret sins that's one thing the other one is why does that happen to me because Allah tests me if I remain real faithful and so on so there, the Christianity also has all three Abrahamic religions have all these two at least and uh, so he wrote on that and he demolished the whole scholastic that means this Catholic way to explain why evil is in the world and suffering and so on and there was an old Jesuit who was his teacher and he was there when he gave his lecture there uh, for, for his uh, dissertation and so after it was all demolished the old Jesuit asked Karen Tark and how do we say it now? How do we say it now? Well, we don't know how to say it now. And at the moment, no religion has an adequate answer to it. Not theoretically, but practically. You can still say, you know, for instance, the Christian can say, practically, I die like Jesus dies. Or uh, humanists can say, I die like Socrates dies. Or there's a new way to die, the fascist way. I discussed that in Budapest a few years ago, and that means to die uh, not alone with your cancer, but with hundred other people, thousand other people. Uh, you heard recently that the Lufthansa guy uh, took his plane down into the Alps and crashed it with 250 people and so on. So Hitler himself, you know, the Soviets were attacking one million Soviets, cannons, the Americans were bombing and so on, dying with a million people at the same time. That is the fascist way of dying in the West. They had Socrates, they had Jesus, and now they have Hitler on top of it to die like a fascist. So, so what's the, the Catholic uh, way of explaining Well, the Catholics, that was, uh, the, these people there in this uh, institute in St. Georg, they taught the scholastic way of, that means they formulated in a philosophical way what you have in Islam and everywhere else. That means man's free will, and man makes wrong decisions and then the gods or God punishes them for their wrong decisions and so on. Yeah, so theodicy. the day they hmm? Theodicy, yeah. Yeah, the Odyssey, yeah. Theodicy. So the the Odyssey is yeah. The Theodicy, Theos means in Greek God, DK means the justice. So it is the justice of God is to be defended against the injustices which happen in his world. Like my wife, for instance, died with uh, seven children, eight children, and died from a horrible cancer, and so on. Why me, O oh Lord, and so on? That is the theodicy problem, right? And when a religion can answer this problem, it rises. If it cannot answer it anymore on a new level of education, evolution, then the religion goes down. That's why we have so many dead religions, right? The uh, Persian religion is dead, the Syrian religion is dead, the Egyptian religion is dead, the Greek religion is dead, uh, and the Roman religion is dead, and so on. So um, it is a decisive thing for for the history of religion. So, and therefore for Karl Heinz Haag, um, giving that lecture and showing that the Catholic way to explain it uh, was no longer viable philosophically, um, and you can take Auschwitz. You know, can you explain the six million Jews as uh, dying for their secret sins? Hitler would say so, but can a normal person say so? You know, or Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Can you say? That was a test of faith. Whose faith? The children who were incinerated at 8 o'clock in the morning when they took their breakfast out. So um, the, the, the pilots, uh, Tippett is still alive, one of the pilots. Another pilot committed suicide. Another pilot became a, a Trappist monk in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains, and I visited him there in the 50s. Uh, and another one, uh, he made propaganda that one should never commit a crime like this, and they put him into an Air Force insane asylum, and he died there a few years ago from cancer. So um, now, so who who is tested, right? So uh, the religions are in a crisis because they cannot give an adequate theoretical answer to it, but they may still have a practical answer. 
So how you die as a pious Muslim or pious Christian or pious Jew and so on. So practically that is still possible. Okay, then we have a few other names. Uh, Hel- uh, Poikert here is important. He belongs to that, to Karl Heinz Sarg, then Helmut Poikert. Helmut Poikert was a refugee from Silesia. You know that at the end of the war, 10 million Germans were pushed out of Poland and so on to, into Germany. He was one of them. He studied Catholic theology. And then he wrote a famous book, which is still there, which is uh, good. That means he was concerned with um, the, uh, the positivism, the positivistic theory, the Vienna School, and then uh, the going from scientism over to communicative thing. And he showed how aporetical, aporia means no way. That means that these theories had no way, and uh, he worked together with Habermas and so on. But then he wanted to get married, and uh, the Catholic Church, Catholic priests cannot get married, so they threw him out of the priesthood, and he became a professor for pedagogy in the University of Hamburg, where the Social Democrat, the Democratic Socialist, was the president, and he took him in, and his wife, and and so on. But he still, his book has some influence. Edmund Ahrens is his uh, student, who continued his work, and then there are people who are working or did work in the institute, the younger, that's the third generation already, or the fourth generation, that is to Beal, and then Axel Honneth has become very famous, he travels here in this country. He has concentrated on something which you can see on your road map there. On the road map, when you look under subjectivity, um, there, uh, under human subjectivity, you have an anthropological level, you have the phenomenological level, and the psychological level. Under the phenomenological level, you have language and memory, work and tool, sex and eroticism, struggle for recognition, and nationhood or community. On the first page, right? First page, yeah. human subjectivity, and there you have these five human potentials or evolutionary universals. So what Habermas did Habermas, uh, the uh, started of course with Kant and with Hegel, and so Hegel had started out with those five potentials, but then he developed into a system. The critical theory is not a system, right? That's important. They are anti-system people because they think that the system distorts reality, that it becomes conservative, and and so on and so on. So, so therefore, what Habermas did. He went behind the Hegelian system, how it started out, and emphasized two things, namely language and the struggle for recognition. But he worked always on language and memory, and then his follower, Hanif, started out with the struggle for recognition. So he writes all these books in our society, all these people who are not recognized, remain unrecognized, whose name is never in the newspaper whose name is only in the newspaper when they die, then they have a few sentences and so on. All the housewives who are not recognized. So all the unrecognized, unrespected, humiliated people in society. That's the same thing what the uh, what our uh, martyr of freedom in, in there, who was with the poor people and with those people who were without rights and so on and looked down on and so on and so on. So, um, Nevertheless, Habermas would emphasize language and memory, but also struggle for recognition, and then um, the um, Honneth emphasized particularly other books are then about study, empirical studies, also together with American sociologists, uh, about this issue of, uh, of uh, struggle for recognition. And then, of course, we have Marx, who uh, emphasized work and tool, and so on, so there they are somewhat different from Marx. And then we have Freud to emphasize sex and eroticism and so on. How did that happen? When the West became more and more secular, then the uniting power of the God who would be behind all human arrangements of marriage and state and so on, this unifying force got lost. And so people then began to struggle to replace this. So then Marx came and emphasized and and put the whole thing together in terms of the human potential, evolutionary, universal of work and tool. 
and Freud did the same thing, but by emphasizing sexuality and, and so on. So it is it's modern people who lost the universal. They lost the God. The God is universal. He puts everything into unity. He maintains everything and so on. When this disappears, you only have the particular left. And even the particulars are not gods any longer. So it becomes totally disenchanted and secular. And now you have to begin a new unity. Because the religious person sees not only the world united, but his personality is united too. And that makes gives that unbelievable strength. You know, if you think of the motto of freedom there, he was offered, you know, to rescind and to apologize. And he had that un- unbelievable strength, you know, to look forward to the to the uh, decapitation, you know, and to the end of his life. What an unbelievable power that mm-hmm. takes, you know. By the way, the question came up yesterday. One of the questions was if there was a similarity to ISIS. Of course, ISIS decapitates people and the king decapitates people. But... The similarity in method does not make them the same yet, right? So that yeah. we emphasize that as well. Okay, so therefore uh, you can always look back now to that human subjectivity and the anthropological level that would mean sex, gender, age, race, nation, and so on. So that is one level of our subjectivity. The other one is then the level of, of these five potentials. And the real psychological level would be memory, which plays such a great role in religion. Think what, you know, if you become an imam, you have to memorize the whole uh, Holy Quran. It's a little bit smaller than the New Testament and much smaller than the Torah, but it's uh, rather big, too, and to memorize all this. So memory plays an important role. And then intellect, reason, and understanding, and then freedom of the will, and so on. These three make up the uh, psychological. And memorize this one, I was 11 years old. Hmm? And this one, I was 11 years old. Really? Oh, wonderful. You are a genius. I knew it always. <laughs> yeah. okay. Very good. So, um, now, the um, and then we have some other names there, whom you know there. There's Eduardo Mendieta. He worked together with Habermas. He's in New York. Um, you have Michael Art, who was my student and was professor in ba- uh, uh, up there in Grand Valley. Grand Valley. Yeah. And then we have Dustin Bird, the most famous of all people. He's just sitting here. So we all work, and Dr. Keller and so on, we all work in the critical theory and have worked in it for many, many years, so I'm 50 years here and, and so on. So um, because uh, that is important now, sometimes Americans underestimate what a theory is. They think of a little hypothesis or something like that. But a theory like that of Plato or Aristotle or Hegel or Marx or whatever, that is a whole world and if you even some of the parts of your theory are not right anymore correct it still may uh, contain its validity so and it's a very powerful thing even if you look a fascist with his theory and you read Hitler's My Struggle that is his theory and what problems we have with that book it is now his authorship has, has ended now and so the book can be uh, translated by everybody and written by and uh, published by everybody. And the Germans are hellishly afraid uh, what will happen to that. What if there is some truth in that fascist theory? What are we doing with this truth? And so on. So I studied Hitler's things in Berlin. I went to the library in Berlin with an American passport. Mm-hmm. I was allowed to read, but no German. My brother, for instance, he was very angry. <laughs> he couldn't go to Berlin and read all that so because he didn't have the right passport and so on. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so that shows you, you know, how how dangerous a theory is, you know, yeah. and uh, not only you know with the uh, with the f- uh, fellow in who has been uh, killed there, but um, you know that Stalin, you know, made sure that Hitler's body would not be found or so. So he even thought that he was still alive, and then they found him, and he is now buried in the garage. You know, when you have a garage. Mm-hmm. There is a hole there where the car drives over Mm -hmm. so that you can get to the car from below. They put Hitler's bones there together with Goebbels and his wife and so on into one thing there in East Germany and nobody knows where so that nobody can come and can make some kind of a uh, monument out of it, you know, in procession. So Hmm? nobody knows where exactly. Nobody, no. No, they cannot find it. the grave of his parents is still there. And so pe- people make pilgrimage 
to Hitler's parents' grave in, in Austria, in Linz. Yeah. Okay, so, but it shows you the power. See, it's such a thing which is not so visible, you know. When I say, what is the theory of Clinton or Obama or whatever, you know, uh, because one doesn't see it. But what we want to learn here is how powerful that is and uh, what, what made Hitler the most, uh, uh, you know, awake person up to the end of his life, you know, was that theory. His life was devoted for it. He lived in celibacy in, or somehow in, in order to devote his whole life to that theory. And the whole nation, as a matter of fact, the whole continent, you know, because it was Italy, it was Croatia, they were all fascist. This theory crashed the whole, like a religion, crashed all these people and made them do unbelievable things to their neighbors, to other races, and so on and so on. So what we can learn with the critical theory is how powerful a constellation, a model, a model of concepts and principles is and so when you, we will see maybe some things of Hitler's end, you know, where he would say, you know, national socialism has come to its end, you know, where he could say it lost, you know. So liberalism was stronger, communism was stronger, you know. Maybe he thought someday it would wake up again. The theory can disappear and then it reappears again, you know, but for the moment it was finished, you know. And, and then he would go for to commit suicide, you know, and shake hands with everybody in the hallway and say goodbye to them and say, well, have a good time and whatever, sending his secretary, we can see the secretary there, home and so on. You can do all that in the power of the identity of a theory. It can shape your whole life and you can say what happens if you don't have a theory like this, you know, which holds your life together. Okay, so... Uh, that so the, these are the names there so and we really wanted to concentrate you know on the newest things but we don't have to do that because we want to it's more important that we get a concept of the whole thing there okay then central notions and problems and we have there the while Habermas that was our first we did there while Habermas belongs to the second generation he has deeply influenced also the third and the fourth generation of Curie Theater so Dustin would be the third or fourth generation you are the fourth, fourth. Third, so we have Dubiel here, the names there, Hannes and, and Gunzlin Schmidt. And I, I met them all in, in Frankfurt there in the Institute and I visited them and Polgert Ahrens and so These are the newer ones. So but Ahrens and uh, Polgert is, of course, now older too. Hannes belongs to the third generation of the Frankfurt School. And so, so we can, uh, you know, look at those. We don't have to. And their political ideals, that was another one which we had here as our discourse, the uh, second one. Not too long ago, after the end of World War II, a generation of young Germans, so how did that come about, this second generation? We said that the first generation were mainly Jews. As Jews, they had to leave Germany, uh, otherwise they would also have been gassed and so on. So, and uh, some went to Russia, but most of them went to, to America and we said to New York and, and so on. So then they decided to come back. That is, so they were for 12, 14 years or whatever, they were here in the States. And then the question, do they want to stay here or not? And so uh, this Jewish idea, that's also a theory, Judaism, it's a theory. You could say that religions are a theory and a praxis at the same time. So they thought they had a mission to rescue Europe. If you know now, Europe is in very bad shape, right? There's uh, the two principles. One is the currency. The euro is in bad shape. You know, it's, it's endangered. But another danger is the open borders. So there are 28 states which have all the borders open, and now come the refugees, and they don't know who comes with the refugees. So suddenly they close all the borders again. So there goes the European Union. So the idea was really to produce the United States of Europe. But last year they could not uh, form their uh, constitution. And one problem was they didn't know if they should get God in the constitution. Uh, it's, it's God is not in this constitution here. Yeah. So some were wanted to have God in the constitution, others not, so they couldn't have a constitution. And so, on. so it is really uh, problematic. So. Nevertheless, they uh, came back and they went back to Frankfurt. The um, uh, Kurt Weil had um, uh, had uh, built that building for them, and we saw the picture there, I think, in my 
somewhere. And um, then the Americans bombed it out in February 1945. And uh, so they came back then five years later and they rebuilt that. The Frankfurt city of Frankfurt was very sorry because they all had been Nazis and threw the Jews out. So um, I was there when all this happened. I came out of a swimming pool in Frankfurt and suddenly I saw the synagogue, a very famous synagogue with Martin Buber and so on in Frankfurt was burning all over the place and the fire engines were standing there. It was in November 1938 and didn't put any water on the synagogue. That was strange. And they put water on the buildings on the right and the left. And then I went to the main street of Frankfurt and things flew out of the stores. It was a very dark day, a rainy day. So the, the lampshades and everything fell on the streets and clothing and so on. I had no idea. There was nobody on the street. It just, you know, there was a busy street usually, the center of the city. And that stuff came out of these Jewish stores. And so at night then, the news came that a Jew had killed a German diplomat in Paris. And therefore, the crystal night came about. And uh, so 30 or so thousand Jews were not put into camps, but into prison. And so the another form of... Uh, solution of the Jewish question came about. So so that was all behind and now they came into that city there. When the American bombed, for instance, they never bombed Heidelberg because the generals of the American Air Force had girlfriends in Heidelberg. They studied there. So when I was in the German Air Force, I went to vacations to Heidelberg all the time. I thought they would never bomb Heidelberg and they never did. But Mannheim, 30 miles further, they bombed it every day. And, and so, so, uh, so in Frankfurt, they left the railroad station and they left the Frankfurter Hof, which was a wonderful hotel, so that they could go into the hotel and then could go to the railroad station. And then they left the IG Farben building, which I mentioned in another story before. They left that standing too because they want to govern from there. So when you bomb, you know, you bomb those things which you don't use and <laughs> leave some which you, where you want to go to. So, and uh, Horkheimer, then they went back and they lived in that hotel, the Frankfurt Hall, Frankfurt uh, restaurant or whatever. And um, Horkheimer became famous because he took the sugar. Everybody was starving in the city, but not in that hotel. So he took the sugar and went down and gave it to the horses because there were carriages which were pulled by the, uh, by, the, by the horses still, and so he fed them at night, and the horses were very happy, and so there was a huge article about his, um, his charity there. By the way, that is something which reminded him of Nietzsche. Who, 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 um, who, who, huh? who did that? Horkheimer. Okay. Horkheimer, yeah, that's so the guy I'm talking about. People die out of hunger and the Yeah, exactly, the yeah. Well, not in the hotel, right? So, the back had said something to eat, but the others didn't, right? So. Yeah. And that went on for years and years. It's like exactly like rescuing the cats from the top of the things and leaving people two thousand five hundred times. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> like Katrina. Yeah. But I mean, the amazing thing was, you know, that they, they I mean, they could stay here, you know. Uh, I mean, a professor doesn't have the rank here like he has in Europe or whatever, so it was somewhat of a degradation. But um, they could have stayed here in Los Angeles or whatever, and they had all kinds of connections. So. But they decided to go into that city, which was 80% bombed out, you know, and uh, to live in those ruins and then try to build all that up. I mean, it's not an easy thing. So he and his friend Pollock, they did this. And also the American military government paid for the institute because they bombed it out. So <laughs> one threw the Jews out and had a bad conscience. The other one bombed it out and had a bad conscience. So they get, get money from the American military government and from the city. So, but now the question was, and that's what I, so what, uh, did they find somebody? You know, was there anybody in Germany who would listen to them? And they did find some people. And that is where this German uh, thing, and what I come into now to, not too long ago, after the end of World War II, a generation of young Germans who had been liberated from the Nazi regime by American soldiers developed admiration for the political ideals of the American nation. So that means we had all grown up under fascism. And now what came with those critical theories to Frankfurt was liberalism. That is because the Frankfurt School people 
rather prefer to go to a liberal country than to go to a communist country. They could all have gone to Moscow. So Brecht went to Moscow for some time, but even he left it then and went to Los Angeles instead. That is decisive, you know, that they made this life decision. They were felt closer to liberalism than they fell to Stalinism, which they considered to be red fascism. Red fascism. So it had something to do with Marx, but it had been perverted. Now, when one says something like that, one has to be very careful. I had one here, an assistant here, uh, Katya, who grew up in the Stalinistic period still, and she felt that Western propaganda had distorted a lot of what was going on there. So the, um, one has to be careful with a concept like red fascism because socialism came into Russia without the liberal period. They jumped liberalism in a certain sense. That means liberalism, capitalist, so, uh, civil society had not fully developed in Russia by 1914 or so. So Russia was furthest back, back in terms of this theory, and the Germans were also back, but not so far as the Russians. The French were further ahead, and the British and the Americans were in front of the whole development. So you can't even measure, you know, what kind, when I said before that we have no health insurance for all people, that is the backwardness of liberalism, yeah. and uh, without having a socialism of any kind to, to repair this. So... Nevertheless, the, uh, so what we then, what they appeared to us was that they brought the liberal tradition to Germany again. And it was, of course, it was not really liberal anymore. It was social democratic. So all the members of the Frankfurt School were members of the Democratic Socialist Party in Germany, which is still there. They don't govern now. Merkel becomes to the Christian, belongs to the Christian Democratic Party. I was on the Christian Democratic Party. I was on the left wing of the Christian Democratic Party, which was responsible for this beautiful system of social welfare in Germany, and why many people like it, you know, in terms of free education, too, and free hospitals, and, and, and so on, and uh, Germany did very well uh, after, after the war. So, but still, when we did this, they were the ruins, and they brought this liberal tradition, and beyond that, they brought it democratic socialist tradition like Bernie. So when you ask, you know, what would the critical theorist vote today, they would all vote for Bernie there. There's no no doubt about this. So but the guys yeah. of Frankfurt School are, are uh, social communists or social democratic? democratic? No, they are. They all became members of this uh, <coughs> democratic, socialistic, democratic party in Germany. That's the same thing what you have in Denmark and Norway and everywhere and what Bernie is following. That's not communism, right? Eh? Hmm? Yeah, Social Democratic Party. Yeah, Social Democratic SDP, SDP, yeah. Social Democratic Party, yeah. Rudy, yeah. we have 15 minutes, so... Okay, so nevertheless, we have come to these political ideas. Let me just close that up. So um, we became familiar through them and people followed Horkheimer and followed Adorno and then Marcuse came sometimes and uh, that is also where then Karl Tag and so on that all comes from there so what we looked at for a moment was the return of those people from America into Germany because they believed that not all Germans had been fascists and that had something to do when I was a prisoner of war in Norfolk they had instituted a re-education program for German prisoners. So there were here 300,000 German prisoners who were in the Africa Corps. That means the people who attacked al Alamein and so on. And then there were 100,000 Italians here who were also in the Africa Corps. So they were all here and they had a very good life here and they were very treated very well. So when I came in Norfolk in the camp there, I left my shirt in the Marseille. I didn't even have a shirt anymore there. So, and I went in, and whom do I did I, did I see? An officer, a general, and that was von Stauffenberg. He was the brother of the Stauffenberg who made the attack on Hitler, which did not function. So he was standing there, and he had all his decorations on there, and his iron cross and so on. 
and uh, he started shouting why we had uh, not uh, defended Germany, why we surrendered, and so on. They had no idea. They didn't believe that all the cities had been destroyed in Germany. They thought it was all enemy propaganda, and so on. So, and in the first night I was in this camp, they sentenced somebody in the name of Hitler to death because he had spoken with a Jewish secret service man outside the camp. It was a crime, and they put his head into the toilet and suffocated him. And when the military police came into the camp, nobody said anything. Nobody betrayed anybody and so on. So that was still done in the name of Hitler, who had already committed suicide on April 30 or so. That was maybe by April, April, May 9th or something like that. So Even after he, he died... They, they still did it in his name. So there, there you see also the power of a, of a theory, right? They are in a camp thousands of miles away from their home, and they still have this theory in their head, and they're killing their own people in the name of this theory. And I had the same thing when I was in the German Air Force. I had Russian prisoners who were um, cleaning my room and so on, and I gave them all my bread. I fed them for years and so on, otherwise they couldn't have survived and so on. But they were still had the communistic theories in their head. So one night I um, saw them in the artillery position. There was an airport and there was an artillery position, and I was there, and I saw in the shooting there the cannons, eight cannons, I saw these Russian prisoners running around with these huge grenades and carrying them. And I said the next morning when they came, you know, and cleaned up, and I said, well, why did you do that? Did somebody force you? There was a Lithuanian soldier who was in control of them. And no, they said we did it voluntarily. He said, because... This is a low bourgeois war, this Hitler war. The next war between the high bourgeoisie and communism will come next. Okay. That is part of the communist theory. Right? And they had it, and they lived away from everything. They spoke German, by the way, fluently. They had a good education system in, in Russia. So, but, you know, in, in all that poverty, not even have enough bread and so on, they still had that theory in their heads and acted, and it held them up that they could stand up and could remain human under these horrible conditions under which they lived. Hitler was bourgeois? Hmm? Hitler low, was low bourgeois. Yeah. No, he was never a working class guy, no. Okay, and what you see in Berlin, you know, the high bourgeois army on one side and the communist army on the other side, just question who oh, is him in the middle, right? So that is another, uh, fascism has its roots in the low bourgeoisie, because the low bourgeoisie at first is old, is medieval, you know, and then they are threatened by the labor unions from below and by the big chains from above. And so it is a struggle of life and death, and therefore the fascist theory fits that situation very well. It's a situation we have to defend ourselves. And it's not only, you know, the low bourgeoisie, it is also the ways we have to defend ourselves. What you see in Germany now is the exact opposite, you know, of what Hitler wanted, and it's exactly what he predicted, you know. So, that, uh, it's also the, 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 that the theory can predict things, it's very important for a theory, you know, to be a real theory, what that you can make predictions. What, 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 uh, what he pre did predict? I mean. Well, I mean, you know that uh, Rudolf Hess, you know, his uh, second in command, he flew about five times to England, you know, not only once. The last time he flew from Munich to uh, to the estate of a lord, there were about 400 lords who were fascists in in, in uh, uh, England, and they wanted to make peace with uh, with Hitler. So he crashed his plane on an estate of a fascist lord and wanted to speak to Churchill. To Churchill, the message was: if you go with us against Russia, then we will kill the communists. If the communists are not killed, you will not have a king anymore, you will not have a bourgeoisie, you will not have a nobility, and so on. Um, so either you come with us and fight there, or you at least remain quiet in the background. That's why he bombed London. You shut up in the background and leave free hand. You know, we will not have a fleet. You can have your fleet. We have a land empire which reaches to the, to the uh, Caucasus and to the... Uh, Siberia, and, uh, the beginnings of Siberia. So that was the deal. And he said, and if uh, the if you go with the Americans, 
you will be nothing, you know, they will dictate to you what you have to do, and that's what they have done ever since 1945. But, but now, I don't understand, now you said that uh, the law of Portugal would use, would tend to be fashioned to protect themselves from right. both right. From the both sides, yeah. The, but wait, but at the beginning you said that they would, uh, they would protect themselves against uh, liberal, uh, liberalism, uh, what was it, against uh, liberalism? They would, uh, yeah, that uh, no against socialism. So yeah. But now in this second one, there is no socialism mentioned in these two above and down. No, I mean it is the labor unions, but also socialistic parties or whatever. The low bourgeoisie. When you read Steinbeck, for instance, here in this country, Steinbeck had the idea that that the low bourgeoisie and the working class should go together. And Marx had the same idea in 1848 when he went to Frankfurt. He thought that the bourgeoisie could unite itself with the proletariat. But the German bourgeoisie united itself with the model, mobil, nobility and the clergy and so on. That was the reason why Hitler had to repeat the French Revolution in you know, hundred years too late. And if you do things too late, they are catastrophic. So um, Schopenhauer, by the way, was in the city, you know, Marx was in the Frankfurt, when they, in the St. Paul's church the, the decision was made. So, therefore, it is possible that the low bourgeoisie can ally itself, but the German and the bourgeoisie here, they are feel threatened by the labor union. If they would be a socialist party, they would feel threatened by them. At the same time, they are also threatened, you know, by the, uh, by the liberalism. And therefore, they are inclined to take fascism, and somebody who says, you know, we have to uh, ruling class or whatever, and um, they like this, you know. They, I mean, the strong language of uh, of Trump, you know, that that gives them confidence. It's really fear. I mean, when you see the low bourgeoisie down in the city, there, you know, the city gives uh, supports them, and then uh, uh, they last for three years. First, your shoe store or a bookstore or whatever, and then in the second year, you suddenly see that they get the prices down of the commodities, you know. In the third year, they disappear because people don't go down there, they go to the malls here, you know, to the, to the big uh, chains. They get it cheaper, it's all together, and, and so on and so on. So they, it's very hard to be a small businessman, you know. And I have a student who opened up the mission point there, up, up there, and he in the meantime has bought up seven others, you know. That means he is the winner, but all the seven others went under. So there's a struggle inside of the low bourgeoisie, but particularly then against the big chains. You know, we have chains here in which are not privately. They are, well, I mean, they are quite big inter national, international chains, you know, mm -hmm. and they cannot compete with them. So, and then when a strong man comes, you know, who uh, speaks to them, they are for it. And sometimes what, what Trump also has is a lot of white collar workers, you know, blue collar workers. That means that these are those who earn enough to believe that they belong to the low middle class. That's why they say sometimes in Flint, you know, the sit strike, we created the middle class. That means the labor unions pushed the price of labor up to an extent where they could have a little house and could have a little car and could send their children to a western and so on. And then they think they are middle class too. Okay, now can we still have something? Yeah. Uh, what did you put in? <laughs> oh, nothing. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, now we have to be punctual right at the end. Okay, very good. We had our fifth meeting tonight, so let's keep to that document here so that we don't lose ourselves in details and particulars, right? So we want to concentrate on the critical theory of religion. Of religion society. Yeah. All right.